Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Rohini, faculty from uh, Bangalore Medical College. Today we are going to discuss about the anatomy of blood supply of face, which includes the arterial supply and the venous drainage of face. Before we start about the arterial supply and venous drainage of the face, first you have to find out where is this arteries originating from. So the main arteries, obviously it has to originate from one of the branches of the heart. So the main branch that is given from the heart is known as the arch of iota. So the arch of iota has to give out branches upwards which go and supply the head and neck region. So head and neck receives the majority of its blood supply through the carotid and vertebral arteries. Now there is common carotid on the right side and left side common carotid artery and there is vertebral artery as well. So the vertebral artery which takes origin from the subclavian artery has got a specific function. So as the name indicates, it passes through a foramen in the vertebra, that is cervical vertebra, and it, its main function is to supply the cerebellum, spinal cord, and the meninges. Okay, so these are the uh, areas of supply of the vertebral arteries. So we leave that alone because it supplies the uh, brain and the other accessories. And internal carotid also supplies all the brain and the other accessories. Now, here the main supply for the face and uh, the other regions, the superficial regions on the face comes from the carotid artery and its branches. Now, the origin of the carotid arteries, there is right common carotid, I said, and left common carotid. Now, right common carotid has a uh, bifurcation. So now it arises from the bifurcation of the brachiocephalic trunk. Like I said before, there is this arch of iota, which divides into three different branches. There is left common carotid, left subclavian, and brachiocephalic trunk, okay, which is also called as brachiocephalic artery. Now, brachiocephalic artery divides into right subclavian and right common carotid. So you note the difference. The right common carotid arises from the brachiocephalic artery. The left common carotid is a direct branch from the arch of iota. So you can imagine the left common carotid has a more straighter course than the right one, which has to make a uh, curve. And then it has to go straight up towards the neck region. So now this is the difference between the right common carotid and the left common carotid. Now this right and left common carotids, they move upwards up to the level of C4 vertebra, that is cervical vertebra, fourth one. And then they divide into external and internal carotid arteries. As the name implies, the external carotid will supply the structures on the outside. The internal carotid goes again straight upwards and does not supply anything else, but it enters the foramen that is known as carotid canal and that will supply the brain, that is the cerebrum. Okay, so now external carotid is what we are interested in because that is what supplies the or gives major supply to the face region through its branches. Now we are interested in external carotid, but before that, does this common carotid give any branches in the neck region? No, it does not give. And internal carotid also does not give any branches in the neck region. So now right and left common carotid, no branches. Internal carotid, no branches. So obviously the external carotid is the only one which gives branches to the face region. Let's see the diagram where you can see the brachiocephalic trunk. You can see the subclavian artery. And here you can see the right common carotid artery, which gives the internal carotid and the external carotid artery branch at the level of C4 vertebra. And you can also see there is a small bulge. Okay, that bulge is known as carotid sinus. Now here there is a bulge and there is also at the entrance that is peripheral part of the internal carotid also there is a bulge. So now at the uh, C4 level, you can feel the pulse. That is uh, the pulse from the common carotid artery. And if you press a little harder, you may feel little, um, you know, uh, the blood gushing through this internal carotid also 
at this level and um, that that is because there is something called baroreceptors so these are the uh, specialized cells that uh, they detect the stretch as a measure of blood supply so now i told you there is baroreceptors similarly there is something called chemoreceptors as well so baroreceptors and chemoreceptors are the two things that you can relate it to the common carotid artery now here i told you there is carotid sinus so carotid sinus is associated with the baroreceptor so that is something you must remember so now it has special uh, specialized uh, sensory cells and they detect the stretch as a measure of blood pressure and then they maintain the blood pressure by passing this information if there is a variation in the flow of the blood they measure that and they pass it through the nerve that is glossopharyngeal nerve and this information is fed to the brain and that's how the blood pressure is maintained but in some cases uh, the baroreceptors are very very hypersensitive to stretch so what they do is immediately when you are trying to take uh, the pulse at the carotid triangle now this you know that the carotid artery is a present in the carotid triangle now what is carotid triangle the sternocleidomastoid would divide the neck region into anterior triangle and the posterior triangle so anteriorly you can see the uh, subdivision that is you can see some more triangles that is submandibular triangle carotid triangle you can see muscular triangle and digastric triangle all these things you can see so now when you see all these uh, triangles the carotid triangle is important as the name itself implies it has this carotid vessels uh, as the content now carotid vessels are there and this is where you can check the pulse so there are various points at where you can check the pulse so this is one of the point in the neck where you can check the pulse and sometimes i told you some individuals are very sensitive with their baroreceptors and uh, external pressure on this carotid sinus when you are trying to check the pulse can cause slowing of the heart rate and decreased blood pressure and they sometimes may undergo syncope or they may um, just pass out so such patients it is not advisable to check their pulse at the carotid triangle because it's of no use and you'll be disturbing them and you may end up making them faint okay now here external to the carotid sinus now all this happens with the carotid sinus external to this carotid sinus there is cluster of nerve cells which is known as carotid body now this carotid body is associated with the chemoreceptors now chemoreceptors what do they do they detect the oxygen content of the blood and this is information is relayed to the brain to regulate your breathing rate so chemoreceptors are associated with the oxygen content of the blood and baroreceptors what do they do they check your pressure that is the pressure of the blood so that is baroreceptors so you remember blood pressure is baroreceptors that is carotid uh, that is carotid sinus the carotid body is for chemoreceptors and that detects the oxygen content of the blood and breathing rate and oxygen content uh, is very very important to have a normal blood pressure so now here there is one more condition with the internal carotid artery now we spoke about carotid sinus carotid body that is associated with the internal carotid and the common carotid it has got nothing to do with the external carotid now internal carotid one more thing that can happen with internal carotid is the wall uh which is which it is made up of it has tunics three layers it has got tunica intima media and adventitia now this tunica intima is the inner one as the name tells you intima innermost one that can undergo something like a sclerosis or it can have plaque like thickening inside and it can reduce the blood flow that is going to the brain remember the internal carotid carries the blood to the brain and it is the main supply to the cerebrum so this can also result in various neurological symptoms like the person can feel headache dizziness muscular weakness and all these things because the blood supply to the brain is reduced why it happened it happened because of the thickening in the one of the walls that is tunica intima of the internal carotid artery 
So now internal carotid artery is more susceptible because it has this carotid sinus where the wall or the lumen is more wider. So suddenly what happens from less blood supply, more blood supply will suddenly gush because of the heavy traffic or whatever you can say, if because of too much of blood gushing in, it can result in wear and tear in the wall. So that particular region can result in you know, carrying uh, more sclerosis or the thickening on the wall. And that is what results in all these symptoms. So the, if the blood supply is occluded, then it can also result in cerebral ischemia, or you can simply call that as stroke. Now that is about the common carotid, which does not give any branch in the neck. Then we spoke about the internal carotid, now let's move on to the actual thing that is external carotid that gives many branches and through its branches, we get blood supply to the face region, okay? So now external carotid artery and its branches, let's see how many branches it has. It has some eight branches in total. So it goes with this mnemonic. Okay. This is Sister Lucy's powder face often attracts medical students. This is how I would remember this easily. And it has this, uh, you know, order. So fourth one is your facial artery, which is the main supply to the superficial structures of the face. And you have some deeper structures on the face, like you have sinuses, paranasal air sinuses and the nasal septum. All these internal structures are supplied by the maxillary artery and the superficial temporal artery. Now, maxillary artery supplies the deeper. The facial artery and the superficial temporal supplies the superficial structures on the face. The facial artery also gives three branches. Superficial temporal artery also gives three, three more branches. So you can imagine how much branch how many branches are there to supply the face region so that's why uh, the face is uh, you know even with emotions or with expression you can blush and then the face can also become very dull with less blood supply so face responds very well to any injuries because of the good blood supply and he, anything that happens on the face like injuries or any nick or a cut can easily heal because of the good blood supply so whenever there is heavy blood supply or very good blood supply, then that results in good healing. So you can explain the plastic surgeries. Now all these plastic surgeries or any cosmetic surgeries can really go well with the face because of the good healing properties. Now let's look at all the branches. Now you have the superior thyroid, you have lingual artery, you have this facial artery, you have occipital artery, ascending pharyngeal, maxillary, superficial temporal. Out of this, the two of them, the posterior auricular and the occipital artery, these two are the posterior branches. That means they are present behind the ear. Okay, posterior is behind the ear. All others are anterior branches of the external carotid artery. So now all the shortest branch of all of this is the ascending pharyngeal artery. So you can say that longest branch would be the facial artery. So now the name itself tells you superior thyroid would supply the thyroid region or the thyroid gland itself, lingual for the tongue, posterior auricular behind the ear, facial artery would supply the muscles of the face, facial expression, occipital artery again behind the ear region, ascending pharyngeal, the pharyngeal area, the muscles of the pharynx, the maxillary artery, supplies basically the nose area, nasal septum, and the lateral wall of the nose. Superficial temporal would supply the temporal region. So with its good uh, supply, sometimes this also can get occluded and that can also result in ischemia to the area that it supplies. Now first let's uh, take up the artery that we are interested in. That is the fourth branch of the external carotid artery. So where is it given? First of all, the facial artery is the main supply to the face and it is given off in the carotid triangle. So in the carotid triangle, where as soon as the carotid external and internal carotid bifurcation happens, now this is the 
uh, fourth branch that is given in the carotid. The facial artery is very tortuous, but not the facial vein. Why is it? It is because in the uh, neck region, we have this uh, pharynx, esophagus, and all these structures where the food enters. And when we talk or and, uh, when we eat the food, this region moves a lot. And also on the face, we have so many expressions. We open our mouth and, uh, you know, we turn our neck, all these things we do. So it is always a, a nice thing that the facial artery is very tortuous. If it was very, very, you know, straight, if it had a very straight course, then it would have resulted in damage to the facial artery. Because it is tortuous, it is easily uh, it is possible for the facial artery to supply all the areas in the face. So it has several functional purposes. The artery can accommodate the head movements as well as the pharyngeal expansion during our uh, swallowing movements. Like I said, during the movement of the cheek, lips and the jaws. And then this artery, it lies above the ascending pharyngeal artery. And it passes, you have to just imagine this, it passes diagonally upwards. So its main um, target area is the face. So from the neck region, it goes upwards underneath two muscles. Okay, near the chin region, you have this muscle that is stylohyoid muscle and the digastric muscle. So it will cross these two muscles. These muscles are present near the a submental triangle. So now they form the boundary of the digastric, forms the boundary of the submental uh, triangle and also submandibular triangle. So it crosses this area and it arches over the gland that is submandibular gland because submandibular gland is present in the digastric triangle. So digastric triangle is also called submandibular triangle. Now here on the submandibular gland itself on the posterior surface, this artery, it uh, forms a groove or it has a, uh, you know, space where it arches over the submandibular gland and then it goes towards the face. So once it goes to the angle of the face, it divides into two branches. As you can see in the picture, it gives two important branches. One is superior labial and inferior labial. At this region, you can detect the facial artery near the angle of the mandible. And you can also identify this artery because it is very superficial in this region. Be before it was deeper because it was very close to the submandibular, that too on the posterior surface. But now you can see that very superficially placed. And you can also detect this artery or locate this artery right in front of the masseter muscle that is anterior border of masseter muscle so now here you can see superior labial branch you can see inferior labial branch and then it goes upwards towards the lateral part of the nose that is ala of the nose and then here it gives this important branch called angular branch okay angular branch has got many small unnamed, uh, you know, anastomosis with the infraorbital uh, vessel as well. And then it straight away goes upwards and it anastomoses with the uh, branch from the ophthalmic. So now that is the course of the facial artery. So altogether, you have this inferior labial, superior labial, and angular as the branches from the facial artery. Now, what branches are these? These are all anterior branches. There are some unnamed posterior branches, which we don't have a name. And also we don't discuss in detail because they don't serve any particular purpose. So like I mentioned, it travels anterior to the masseter. It reaches angle of the mouth. It gives the branches that is superior labial and inferior labial branches. What does superior labial branch supply? It supplies the skin, muscles of the upper lip region, nasal septum, at the side of the nose, and all these areas. The inferior labial supplies the orbicularis oris muscle that is present around the mouth. So it actually pierces the orbicularis oris. This particular point is very important because you might be thinking, which one supplies the inferior, the orbicularis oris muscle? 
the inferior labial is what supplies the orbicularis oris muscle and then it runs a tortuous course along the edge of the lower lip between this muscle and the mucous membrane so that means it lies deeper to this orbicularis oris muscle and hence it pierces it and then what is the termination of the facial artery it terminates by forming the angular artery near the medial angle of the eye now here what happens to the angular artery does it end there no it takes place same thing happens with the venous drainage also with the veins also same thing happens hence whatever infection on the face happens that is very very remote or very very rare can travel to the inside of the brain so where the where there is something called venous sinuses there is cavernous sinus so any infection carried from the branch of external carotid and when it happens with the uh, anastomosis with the internal uh, internal carotid that can be carried to the cavernous sinus and that can result in something called thrombosis of the cavernous sinus so that is an infection so that can happen but this condition is very very rare and hardly seen now let's move on to the superficial temporal artery now superficial temporal artery as the name implies it is very superficially placed so anything that is superficial you can definitely see whether you can look for any pulsations you can feel the pulsations now um here i told you in the neck there is this carotid tubercle where which uh, where the carotid sinus could be pressed against the tubercle and then you can look for the pulse now another point where you can look for the pulse is superficial temporal artery where you can press it against the zygomatic artery so you need some resistance when you want to feel the pulse you need some resistance same thing with the upper limb uh, radial artery also you have to press it against the radial bone only then you can feel the pulsation how can you feel otherwise so now here it is felt when it is pressed against the zygomatic arch above and in front of the tragus of the ear you can feel the pulsation now branches of the superficial temporal artery that supply the areas near the orbit are the anterior temporal there is the zygomatic and transverse facial artery now all these three branches supply so you should remember facial artery also gives three branches superficial temporal also gives three branches so all together good number of six branches end up supplying the face region that is about the arterial supply i'm talking about so now here what does anterior temporal artery do it supplies the skin and muscles of the forehead region so the name you should look for temporal region so anterior temporal you should try to break the word anterior part temporal region it supplies the skin and muscles of the forehead and it also anastomoses with the supraorbital and supratrochlear arteries the supraorbital and supratrochlear are branches from the internal carotid so here also there is mixing of internal and external carotid artery blood so there is again mixing of both the bloods then there is one more important branch which supplies deeper structures that is maxillary artery so where does this maxillary artery arise maxillary artery arises behind the neck of the mandible so little higher higher as you go up towards the head it arises and then this um, artery maxillary artery obviously it lies in the maxilla bone area and it lies behind the neck of the mandible when it lies uh, behind the neck of the mandible obviously it is the main source for the condyles of the mandible so it acts like a uh, you know important blood supply to this region and it is first embedded in the substance of the parotid gland so you can locate this maxillary artery in the substance of the parotid gland along with the other structures there are many things that is present within the parotid gland you can uh, look for the formation of retromandibular vein within the parotid gland you can look for the maxillary artery you can look for you can also look for the facial nerve which passes from the parotid gland onto the face as 
terminal branches, five branches are given, like goose feet, five branches. So that happens by crossing the parotid gland. So what happens to this maxillary artery later on? It passes between the two portions of the mandible, that is ramus and the spinomandibular ligament. This is very, very important. So if you want to look for the maxillary artery, you have to look between the ramus of the mandible and spinomandibular ligament, and then it goes deeper to the lateral pterygoid muscle. So you can say that the lateral pterygoid muscle is the key muscle where you can use as a landmark to divide this artery into three portions. Otherwise, it is very difficult to uh, you know, remember the branches. There are many branches that is given from the maxillary artery because this is the solo supply to all the deeper regions in your face. So you should remember that. So when it is uh, the solo supply, the branches are also more. So lateral pterygoid muscle is the key muscle which divides this maxillary artery into first branch, second branch, and the third branch. The first branch or the first portion is also called uh, the mandibular part. The second part is called pterygoid part. The third part is called the palatine, the pterygopalatine part. So now why it is called pterygopalatine? Because the last portion enters the pterygopalatine area. So now this is how it is um, seen, where you can see the lateral pterygoid muscle dividing this into three portions. There is a first part, second part, and the third part. Now this branch external carotid, it gives off this maxillary artery, and then it travels upwards to give this terminal branch that is superficial temporal. So now here you can see the first portion, which you can rem remember as Damai, D-A-M-A-I. So now you can see D, that is deep auricular, anterior tympa tympanic, mid middle meningeal, accessory meningeal, and inferior alveolar. So inferior alveolar, again, it passes through the mandibular foramen on the mandible, on the inside of the mandible near the lingula, and then it exits out as mental branch. Okay, so now this is another branch that is given, that is a branch to the mylohyoid. So now here you can see it passes through the inferior, uh, through the mandibular foramen. So now here, these are the five branches from the first part. The second branch or the second part has got these branches. All are muscular branches, as you can notice. What are these muscles? What group muscles are these? These are the muscles of mastication. So muscles of mastication are supplied by maxillary artery and mandibular nerve. There is nothing like, there is no word like mandibular artery. There is no mandibular artery. There is only maxillary artery and mandibular nerve. So that area, maxillary artery is there. Maxillary nerve is there. But mandibular artery is not there. You must remember. So don't get confused with that word. Mandibular nerve is very big, but there is no mandibular artery. Maxillary artery is very big. But the nerve maxillary, uh, maxillary nerve is very small one. The supply is also very small or limited. Now, this is the area or these are the branches that the second part of the maxillary artery gives. And this is the third portion that is pterygoid canal or artery to the pterygoid canal, you can say. And these are the branches. I would just remember this as uh, PIG, PAS, PIG pass. So the first one, pneumonic, damai. The second one is all muscular branches. The third one is pig pass. Now you can see posterior superior alveolar, infraorbital, spinopalatine, greater lesser palatine, and pharyngeal branch or palato vaginal. To the, that is to the palato vaginal canal. So these are the branches that is given from the third part of the maxillary artery. So this maxillary artery. Hence, it supplies all the deeper structures. Now you can see the tympanic area it supplies. That means the uh, TM joint is supplied by that. Deep auricular it supplies. Then it also supplies the meninges, middle meningeal, meninges area it supplies. Then you can see that there are 
branches to the muscles that is deeper structures again now here it ends up supplying all the spinopalatine lesser palatine all this uh, structures in the deeper areas so hence the maxillary artery is the one which supplies deeper structures the superficial temporal and facial are the ones which supply the superficial structures like the muscles the cutaneous branches the skin and other uh, other small small structures in the on the face so this picture shows you how the maxillary artery traverses through the parotid gland and you can see the first part second part branches third part and you can also see the long the the longest um, you know course taken by the inferior alveolar artery and how it passes through the mandible only when you cut through the mandible you can see this and you can also see the mylohyoid branch because mylohyoid is present below the mandible okay below the mandible it forms the floor of this area that is the submental triangle mylohyoid forms the floor of the submental triangle and anterior digastric will form the boundary the sides of the submental triangle so this area is supplied by mylohyoid the lower part of your chin is supplied by mylohyoid branch this is the branch given to all the teeth so this is how it looks if you cut the mandible and visualize the branches and you can see the third part giving all those branches to the deeper structures so these are the branches from the external carotid and you can see the superficial temporal right away going up the three branches from the superficial temporal also you can visualize so that is about the blood supply of the face hope i am clear with that and uh, now moving on to the venous drainage of the face now venous drainage is pretty much same it has the same means like the facial vein is the one but what difference you see between the vein and the facial artery the main difference is that had a tortuous course but the vein does not have a tortuous course with the distance between them so immediately you may not be at the vein there is some gap between them and you can see that the supra trochlear supra orbital vessels are here and then you can see that there is this uh anterior division of retromandibular you can see and then you can see posterior division of retromandibular and all this together they form this um the facial vein and then the facial vein joins this anterior division of retromandibular and together the blood is dumped into the common facial vein and from the common facial vein it goes into internal jugular vein and that joins the subclavian vein and obviously subclavian will take the blood to the superior vena cava so like that there is internal jugular and external jugular are the two things face through all these tributaries in the in case of vein we don't call them branches we call them tributaries so now here what you see this entire uh, thing that you can see here that is the superficial temporal the maxillary the maxillary vein together forming the posterior uh, together forming the retromandibular vein and the retromandibular vein divides into anterior division posterior division the posterior division again joins with the posterior auricular vein and together it forms the external jugular vein now here two things are very important one is formation of the external jugular vein how is external jugular vein formed so that drains from the back side of the ear this area is drained by that and the front portion of the face is drained by the internal jugular so internal jugular basically from the facial vein now here this portion is little complicated anterior joins the facial vein to form the internal jugular vein the posterior one goes on to join with the the posterior auricular to form external jugular so these two ultimately they join the subclavian and then the blood is guided to the 
superior vena cava from superior vena cava it goes into the chamber of the heart where the which is the receiving chamber that is the right atrium so but what happens here is the supra orbital and supra trochlear they join together to form facial vein and here there is a um, you know small thing that can happen now here the facial vein has got some connections with the deep facial vein now here from the facial vein in a retrograde manner the infection if there is any infection that is happen or uh, happened on the uh, you know dangerous area of the face that is on the sides of the nose the philtrum of the nose that is the gap between the nose and the upper lip sides of the nose and the upper portion of your lip a region this triangular area if there is any infection inflammation or any um, carcinoma kind of uh, uh, thing happened then that could be drained by the facial vein and in a retrograde fashion it could be transferred to the deep facial vein from there it has got connections with the pterygoid plexus of veins and these emissary veins could carry the infection towards the cavernous sinus now when it carry to the cavernous sinus what can happen the cavernous sinus can result uh, in inflammation and then that can result in thrombosis of cavernous sinus we have reached the end of the session and i thank everyone who joined this session thank you